So yeah. Missy, thanks for reaching out to me. Anyway, so um, maybe just want to start with introducing yourself and and what made you decide to share your story today. Sure. Yeah. No, my name is Missy Applemont, and um, I am the youngest of ten. I have five brothers and four sisters. And my mom was diagnosed with uh, bipolar and about primarily uh, schizophrenia uh, long before I was born. And then, um, yeah, so it, it was a challenge growing up, um, you know, felt very alone. And uh, as I've uh, coped with, you know, just everything that came along with being um, raised in this kind of a family with these challenges, you know, I've had a lot of hurdles I've had to overcome. and. I, um, you know, listened to several podcasts out there and I was so grateful for those folks out there that had um, another parent, you know, co-parent that was healthy and helped and all of that. And that was not my experience. We had to, um, we were very fearful of my father and, and had to dodge that. So it's, there's just a lot, been a lot to overcome. Um, and as I've gotten older, I have just this desire to reach back and to help the children because they're forgotten i was forgotten you know the children who have parents that have these struggles and so that's always been on my heart to do that and i'm uh, writing a book and in my research i you know happened upon your podcast and there just aren't a lot of resources out there and so you know as i was listening to your uh, various guests that you had it was just like oh i found my people you know it's a club nobody wants to be a part of but I just resonated so much. And then that's what led me to reach out to you. No, thanks, Missy. And thanks for sharing that. And yeah, that must've been very, very tough. Like, um, you know, so we'll, we'll talk more about that today, but yeah, having 10, being in a family of 10 kids alone mm-hmm. in normal circumstances with both parents and stuff would be, would be full on. But um, how did you, how did your mum manage? Because having bipolar disorder, my mum had two kids and it was a struggle at times. And then I can't imagine, having, you know, being a father of 10 with, with that. So how, how, how was that all? Well, you know, by the time I came along, um, she was well into struggling with her illness. I've heard you speak about your mom and, and what I experienced, like my mom was way over medicated and shock treatments, you know, the whole, mm. uh, all, all the things. And she became very reliant on medication um, and she just did, you know, she, she just <laughs> said yes and took the medication and it was supposed to help and it wouldn't help. And then there's the side effects and, you know, all the things. And basically, um, you know, she, she did the best that she could. Um, and I hear my older siblings talk about the mom before there was an event, there was like a crash um, in her life. And prior to that, I think at that time when that happened, um, she, and I believe it was either the late 50s or early 60s um, that that happened for her. But prior to that, she was this great, I mean, very involved. She was a, she was a country Western singer and she would play the mandolin and she, I have her guitar sitting right here next to me. Um, and she played the harmonica and she'd make these great meals and made the kids clothes and bathe them. But that's a mom I never knew. So by the time I come along, she's in bed. That's 24 seven. Basically she was in bed. She would get up, you know, around four o'clock every day, maybe four thirty, five forty, you know, in there before my dad would get home and she would try to put dinner together. Um, you know, and it was struggle. It was very hard. Is very hard. So, but I don't have any memories of her um, t- caring for me at all. So mm-hmm. it was it was tough. And this was in the sixties. Was it predominantly or seventies or when was it? Um, so that I was I was born in the uh, the late sixties. So she she had been sick for a good I think about like ten years before I arrived on the scene. Yeah. And I can imagine back then, obviously, mental health or mental illness wouldn't have, would have just been completely under the table. Yeah. Whereas now, that, now it gets mentioned a bit, um, right? But but in regards to back then, I can imagine it just would not have been mentioned at all. So there was literally no support for you whatsoever at all, was there? No, right. no. I mean, we were very involved in the church, but even the church, um, they they knew the, the way my mom's schizophrenia sort of manifested its hurt uh, in with mom was. She was a devout Christian 
And she knew that Bible just like the back of her hand and uh, the voices that she heard come, came to her and she thought it was God, you know, telling her to do these things that were right. And so, and, you know, for a little kid, that was really scary because mm. um, they were, there's some crazy stories. I'll, I'll, I may or may not put them in my book, but, and, you know, you try to reason with her, you try to talk with her, you try to help her. Um, and I think one of the worst parts for her was that she, she, there was a part of her that knew, you know, she would have these moments where she would come and she knew what she was doing was just <laughs> not right. And she would, um, you know, fight that. And there'd be such torment, you know, on her face. And that, that was really hard to see that struggle when she would, it's like she would come to and she would know, but she couldn't bear like disappointing God. And so she had to follow through with what God was telling her to do. Of course it was, it was her illness, but so it was, it was, um, it was tough for her. And, but you know, when she was good and that was something that I wanted to convey on this is like when she had her moments of, you know, sanity, oh, she was, she was beautiful. She had this big, bright smile. She had this amazing voice. She was smart. She was funny. She was a stay at home mom. But again, um, you know, I didn't have anywhere near like a, a, a normal, I think, mom experience that most people have. Um, so it was, yeah, she did the best she could. Uh, she, she really did. Uh, it, it, it was just a really, really uh, difficult set of circumstances for us all. Yeah, I can relate to what you just said then. Like my mum was very religious too. I don't think she would, mm -hmm. would have been maybe as religious as your mum, but she, same thing happened as well. Like, you know, God told me this or God told me that. And, right. you know, and as you said, you know, you're a young kid and you just don't know, like your parents, they're supposed to guide you. And then I'm not a religious person now, but um, how, did, how did you work that out in your head as a, as a younger person? Because obviously you rely on your parents, you just trust them. So whatever they say, you trust them. And you might not be at a stage yet where you can sort of go, well, that's the illness talking you you before you even become aware of that. So mm -hmm. how did you go as sort of separating that sort of fact or fiction uh, as a younger person? <laughs> yeah, that was a journey. Um, and I did have the benefit of my older siblings. So I, you know, like I, I divide them up in the top five and the bottom five. So I, you know, I have a niece from number two in the family, uh, my sister, and she has a daughter. We're the same age. So, you know, most of the top five were out of the home, but I would watch, right? I was really good at hiding and I was really good at um, observing, right? Now it's my superpower, right? I can really read a room. I'm, I'm, in, um, I'm a sales executive, right? I can really read the person sitting across from me. And so I became very good at that. And I would take cues from them. Um, of course, I went through phases myself where, I was really angry when I was older at my mom. Mm -hmm. um, there were other phases when I was younger, I was very protective of her. Like in my mind, in my little mind, I think I was like, no, I have a good mom. She's a good mom. And I remember my older siblings would, you know, roll their eyes or they would, um, you know, they wouldn't want to be around for long. And it, honestly, it was every man for themselves because we're trying to dodge my father. And then, um, trying to just not do anything that would set mom off, you know, get on her nerves. So don't get on mom's nerves. That was the saying. So I think I really read, read the room, read my siblings. And I was like, I knew something wasn't right. I wasn't right. And I have, you know, <laughs> a memory of um, my one little friend that lived next door and she came over and my mom's thing was, um, God would, God would tell her to, uh, make sure everybody was saved. Right. So she came to my, and it was mortifying to me because here she is to my, my friend saying, all right, do you know, Jesus, <laughs> you know, let's pray. And she literally had my friends kneel at the couch and I'm mortified, you know, and that was the last time I ever brought a friend over. And so we really, uh, we pretty much isolated, um, because you just don't want people to have a front row seat to that. And it, it was, you know, a lot of other things as well. So, um, yeah, you just kind of figured it out with sort of a survival skills, I think, um, that just sort of evolved. 
to uh, don't make dad mad and don't set mom off and just kind of try to fly under the radar. Did your older siblings, the ones, the five who were at a home, did they help you much mm-hmm. at all? Did they did they give you some advice or how did that sort of work? No, nobody talked, you know, nobody talked about it. Um, and everybody was trying to figure out, I think for a long time, exactly what was wrong. And then she had this diagnosis of schizophrenia. I never knew about it. In fact, I didn't know that that was the exact diagnosis until I was a freshman in college. And, and then I did my own research and, uh, you know, and figured out that's what it was. Um, you know, later on in mom's life, I actually helped her find another doctor and they had her reevaluated. Um, this was after I have three boys and this was after I had my, my, they were all little, but, you know, took her back, had her evaluated again. You know, and of course it comes back as the same thing. Um, but no, we didn't really talk about it. Uh, and until later, we had a, a tragedy where one of my oldest um, nephew passed unexpectedly. His father uh, is number one in the family. And he brought us all together through that grieving process that he had gone through of uh, grieving his son. And he was actually a counselor himself. Uh, that took you know, what he would give back to people who are grieving to a whole nother level through his own personal experience. And when there was an incident where he brought us all together and he said, um, we were st- sitting in a steak and shake in Indianapolis. And he said, we, we have got to start talking. We've got to start talking or it's going to eat us all up. It, 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 we've got to share stories. And I remember I broke down sobbing to my brother, Scott, who's number nine, you know, I just collapsed in tears and the others were all just like crying. But then that, that opened it up and we each started sharing stories. Of course, the top five have horrible guilt over, you know, leaving the last five. Mm. And they, they have said, we thought it would get better, you know, and it, you know, it, it didn't. And so I've got, uh, you know, still to this day, it's like one of my, my fears is, being abandoned, being left that I have to fight against. And because I would have a a sibling that would actually care for me and I'd become dependent, well, they would move, you know, they would graduate high school, they would leave. And then the next one, and then they'd leave. (laughs) So, you know, that's super suck (laughs) Mm. to become, but then, you know, um, I, I learned early that like I had to take care of myself and I did, um, you know, and there's some good and good and bad with that. Now, now, growing up, were you told? Did you know? But did you did you like look into the illness? So I knew growing up, my mum had bipolar, but I I really didn't want to know about it. Like I knew that was that was what she had, but I never really went into understanding it or sort of like really trying to understand. I just knew, right? You know, she get unwell, she go to hospital, shock treatment, be away for three months, and come back. So when you were growing up, did you do much? research about it or how did you or was it just something you know she's got this and then that's it and that's the way she's going to act and I'm going to try and work around her and all that sort of stuff yeah that was basically I didn't know until you know freshman in college that's what she had I knew that she wasn't right um you know and, and in high school I knew she had mental illness I didn't know exactly what it was you know back then I think that I saw like schizophrenia was a multiple personality disorder I think that was, that's what would often be confused. Um, uh, I, I didn't know, no one ever sat me down. No one ever said, it was always, no, pray for mom. Don't upset, don't upset her. Um, now I would say like, I've got a few good memories when I was in high school of when she was uh, with it. Like, you know, then she would ask me, what do you want for breakfast? And that was like, what? <laughs> And I remember once I asked her for a hamburger for breakfast and she laughed and she made me a hamburger for breakfast. <laughs> and, you know, that's a great memory that I have. Um, and, you know, and there's a couple of other ones where she would, I would, I ran track and I would go and practice running and she would just walk with me. And, and I remember driving there and, and her being happy and, um, and that was a great day. Mm. Uh, but then, then all of a sudden, you know, it could turn on a dime. And then all of a sudden the voices are back and off we go again. I have some memories of her being gone when I was really young. Um, She would just not be there. 
So I didn't notice it as much. And she wasn't there because she was in, institutionalized. Again, she was in a, uh, the mental hospital. And I didn't realize it because she just, it's not like we had this day-to-day -day structure. Um, she was always in bed. She was always in bed. And so when she was gone, like it's not a whole lot changed for me. Mm. So now did you have to go to the mental hospital to visit her or how did that work when you were younger? I have one very, very vague memory of being there with her and they would give them these crafts to do. Mm -hmm. And she would make, um, I remember her making this mosaic, like a trivet, right? That you put a, a hot pot on. And she also made a, a great big table. And that that must have been when she was in there for much longer. But it was all these little mosaics that they would tile in. And I have a very vague memory of that. But it's funny because whenever I see a mosaic trivet like that, it turns my stomach. I automatically, like my body remembers. And I get um, just, well, like I, I can't even look at them. And it's a, it's a trigger for me. But I... I don't think that I went very often, but I was pretty young. Um, and when I got into, I think, middle school, high school, she, I don't remember her ever being in the hospital then. Mm. She was home. Yeah. Well, that's, a good, that's a good thing. Um, yeah. But with, with the, so what about the treatments back then for her? You mentioned medication before and uh, electric shock treatment. I think I changed mm -hmm. now to say could be ECT, but it's electric shock yes. treatment. But yeah. um, yeah, what was your experience with like with that? Because it can be very confronting, especially if someone said ECT or electric shock treatment to see them afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. was it explained to you first of all? Were you sort of involved in it or in the consultation of it all? No, not at all. the 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 big um, story from the family is like one of I think it was the first time she had had it done, and I wasn't even on this planet yet and she came home and they lined all my siblings up and she was trying to remember their names and uh the eldest who had cared you know how there's these amazing stories of my older siblings because they basically had to take turns going to school because they cared for all the others and had to watch my mom and protect my mom and keep her in the house and all these things and um, but they tell the story of having to, uh, you know, stand up there and being excited, like, come on, mom, you can get it, you can get it, you can get it. And she would finally find the name. And, um, and yeah, so that's the only um, real memory. And it's through my siblings telling the story, because I, I was not born yet. And so she's, she, I, I know she had, um, had gone several times. I don't know how many times. Uh, I know her memory was very, she was very bright. She, she was very smart, but um, that took a toll on her. I know uh, in our, our, we had a very small home. We were very poor and we had a, uh, to the left of the kitchen sink, there was a, a cabinet on the second shelf. There must have been 20 or 30 different bottles um, with her name on, and she would take handfuls every day. And then yeah, I remember there was one in particular, it was a liquid, and that was the one that would just knock her out. So when it was bad, she'd just be, you know, and that brought on a lot of anxiety because she would often get up in the middle of the night and go and, you know, open that cabinet door and I'd hear that creak. And then you just like, oh no, <laughs> here we go. And, um, you know, and she was doing what she thought, you know, for some sense of relief. Um, so it was hard. Mm. It was hard for her. And did many, um, did any other families or the school or someone, did other people know about your situation to sort of help you guys or was there anyone else involved or not really? No, not really. I, um, you know, and I was talking to my husband, you know, about some of these memories um, in the car earlier today. And I was thinking, you know, I don't know how the school didn't do something uh, because, you know, at a very young age, I, I there was nobody to do laundry. Right. Um, so I'm trying to find clothes and I'm like in kindergarten, maybe first grade. I'm trying to find clothing <laughs> to wear. 
and there's nothing clean. And I'm having to pull clothes out of a dirty hamper that I never should have been wearing. And I know or something that was way too small or something way too big for me. And I'm like, I, I don't know why the school, um, I, I suppose it was just a different time where you just didn't talk about it, you know, uh, especially mental illness. Um, or perhaps maybe they had contacted, you know, and I just didn't know about it. And they, I don't know if there were ever any conversations, not to my knowledge. Um, there was never anyone to come in. I, I, I have heard stories that there were some family members that wanted to split us up and my dad wouldn't allow it. He kept us all together. Um, you know, and to this day, the 10 of us are so tight. We adore each other. We love each other. We protect each other. And we are, you know, each other's biggest advocates. They're the most generous, loving people on this planet. And I've under, as I get older, I understand that's not the norm in many families. But for the 10 of us, I think because of what we all survived together, um, we are just as tight as can be now. Mm, that's great to hear. Yeah. And, and, yeah. The, um, and you mentioned something before about being angry towards your mum, which is something mm. that I can relate to because I was for a very long time until up until before she passed. So do you want to just explain why you have that anger just for people to understand it from your perspective mm. or from a kid's perspective with the parent? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I, I had a lot of anger early on and it was um, a lot of it was immaturity. Um, you know, when you get older and you see how other families operate and live and you're just like, why, <laughs> what is up? You know, why can't you? be okay we would have moments you know and sometimes it might be nine months of pretty normal um but then it would quickly change or you might just have some ups and downs maybe you'd have a good week and then you know then she'd be back in bed or gone um but i think you know i was i was angry i, I would often for a long time i would try to talk her out of it I would try to reason with her. I would try to explain. I try to understand. Uh, and she, there was just <laughs> nothing I said could help. And, you know, a part of it, I think now was a protective mechanism that I had that I activated. Like, I can't depend on you. Every time I would depend on her or even my father, I would be let down. You know, and for, and I hate saying this because I love my siblings so much, but there are periods of time when I was younger, I would depend on them and then they'd be gone and, and they were doing what they needed to do. They were going to college or going, getting out. Everybody just wanted to get out. Um, so I don't hold any ill will towards them, but I think a part of it was I am, I am not going to try anymore. And you're, I, I resented her, you know, I resented the illness. I didn't understand the illness. Um, now I have so much empathy and compassion for her um, and for what she, she survived, um, you know, and I helped her quite a bit later in, in her year. She passed in uh, uh, 09. So it, I think it was, uh, you know, just resenting what I didn't have. Um, and, you know, and, and I had a counselor tell me once, as I go through, as, as you have children, as you hit other different milestones in your life, you're going to have to come back and deal with certain aspects of this. You know, I'm, I, you know, when I was the age of what she was when she had me, or, you know, when I had my first son, um, when I had my first baby, that was, that wrecked me. Cause I'm, you know, especially towards my father, I'm like, how in the world <laughs> could you ever to your, you know, your own child. Um, so it was really, I have come a long way of matured understanding what it was, what she was dealing with, uh, you know, all the children, the pressure, the immense pressure she had to have felt. Um, she's, she was mighty uh, for what she survived. Uh, thanks for saying that, Missy, and I can completely agree with you. And I'm I'm glad you you articulated it far better than what I could. But you said 
you, yeah, you get you need to get that sense of maturity. Once you get a bit more, more mature and you can step out and see that foresight, you have a bit more life experience and you can have a bit more right. probably empathy. You just don't have that as a younger person, right? Right. As you right. said, you get really angry, you're mad at the person, like, you know, why? You know, and if you go, especially like for me, the worst is when we used to go to you go to a mate's house and you see a stable family and the parents have yeah. got a jobs and stuff like that. Yeah. And you're like, well, why don't we have that? And you just that's <laughs> right. the way your mind goes as a kid. You get real jealous and stuff. And that's where right. the anger comes and it's hard to let go. But you said it, you said it brilliantly brilliantly about that um the foresight. And you once you have that ability to empathize with it from their position, you know, look, your mum's trying to raise 10 kids with this mental illness, which she can't control, like it's not her fault right. at all. You, you, it just all slips away the anger and, and all the and you become way right. more understanding and way more caring. But it's something I wish I got at a younger age. But yeah, yeah, you know, me too. Yeah, but you sort yeah. of almost needed someone to sit you down at a younger age. Miss, I'm sure you probably you could have got that foresight if someone just sat you down and yeah. sort of explained that to you. Really, couldn't right. that would have helped, wouldn't it? Oh, it would have been yeah. amazing. Like I, I hear on you know as I've, I've been listening, you know some of these folks that have been guests and they've said, well, I had this resource or that resource, or, and somebody had mentioned like there were resources right down the street, and she didn't even know. And I'm like, oh, wouldn't that have been amazing if someone could have, you know, we could have been tagged or flagged somehow either the school or through moms of doctors and said, let's get some help for these kids and sit down and say, okay, this is what's going on. This is the brain. This is, you know, the chemicals that are out of whack and explain it, you know, age appropriate. Oh, that just would have lifted so much. It, you know, is it my fault? Did I make mom nervous? Did I set her off again? You know, all the guilt and and everything that you deal with because you're a kid. You know, you don't it's you don't have the capacity to fully understand and to have had somebody to come in or someone to come in and do laundry or food, <laughs> you mm. know, tutoring. Tutoring would have been amazing, yeah. you know, because I struggled so much through school. Um you know, I was very, had horrible self-esteem, just horrible, and was very, uh, you know, the lone kid, made fun of, bullied, because, you know, the clothes, and I'm sure, I, you know, <laughs> dirty clothes, and I was dirt, you know, just, I didn't have the basics at that young age, and that's, that's where my heart is now, you know, and that's, in the book that I'm writing now, that's true, that reach back, to go back, and as so many of us, I think that of gone through really difficult, difficult set of circumstances. I think the way that we can heal ourselves and kind of redeem the situation, right, is reaching back and helping others that, because you know, they're out there that are going through this and to be able to say, you know what, there's all kinds of hope, you got this mm -hmm. and offer resources and to be able to say, um, you know, you're not a victim. And that, that is one thing that it was a just a watershed moment in my life was the day I realized I was not a victim of my circumstances or how what I was born into and that I could choose it it's going to be hard it's going to be hard because I didn't know a lot of stuff and I had to figure that out but I was so determined you know and, and you know I know there's there's more there's more to unpack and more to learn and more to let go of um but I always think that there's a reason for everything. And if my reason is to reach back and help others, uh, there's no greater joy than to provide hope and relief to another, you know, a teen, you know, that's kind of going through this, you know, still a lot of people, like you've said it many times, and we'll talk about depression and anxiety and mental health challenges, but to get into the, the heavy mental illness and what that looks like and the treatments and the families and all of that, like no one's doing that. Yeah, they aren't. And, and that's, but it's really prevalent, Missy, as you would know. And you look at the statistics, like, well, I'm just talking Australian statistics on Australia. There's around 2%, I think it's around 2% globally of people have bipolar, mm -hmm. right? And most of those people are going to have families. So you can have a large amount of people who have been affected by it, but it's not something that we hear uh, a lot. Like in America, I, I presume mental, mental health has now been spoken about a bit. And, and um, mm -hmm. in Australia, it's the same thing, but we just don't go beyond the depression and anxiety, people just think that. Right. Like even now, right. let, let's say, I'm not trying to get celebrity based here, but like Kanye West, what's got bipolar disorder. And mm -hmm. you don't really hear that mentioned in regards to what's going on at the moment, right? So it's something where there's still a complete lack of understanding. And, but it's annoying because there's people in positions of power 
who are decision makers or who are well known as celebrity who just keep it under the rug. And a right. great example in Australia was our federal health minister. The government just got ousted, but he released, he had a bipolar mother who was really full on and like done a lot of horrible things to him. And it wasn't, mm. until, and he was the federal health minister and the, and for a long, long time. And it wasn't until I think he was, I think it was like three or four years ago when he re- released the story nationally about it. And he's like in his fifties, it's like, mate, you had this position, you've been in politics for like 20 years or whatever you've been in. Like he's a, a doctor and all that sort of stuff. And you've only starting to tell people now, like, it's just like, you could help people. And as you said about what you're with your book and what you want to do is you want to reach back and help. And I sort of, I, I find it really frustrating when I hear about people who have um, the similar stories to us who can actually have a platform who just don't say anything and or do anything about it. it. Yeah. And it's very, very <laughs> frustrating because it can really yeah. help a lot. And especially where it can help is with the funding. So at the, in Australia, mm-hmm. I don't know what America's like, but in Australia we have a couple of big brand mental health brands, right? Um, they're called beyond blue and one's black dog Institute and stuff like that. And it's all about the just depression and anxiety and that's it. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing about, um, you know, bipolar specifically schizophrenia specifically or young care as we call them, which are basically kids who have parents with mental illness. So mm. we have a couple of organizations that I know about. I'm really passionate about over here and support, but what's it like in America for one from your research or from what you know online, when you're researching for your book in regards to, um, support that's available for let's say a, a Missy who would be in, growing up in today's age, what would, what, what's there that's available? Yeah. So I, like where I've raised my kids is on a place called Fishers, Indiana. And their um, mayor was, I, I don't know why he was so passionate about, Oh, I do remember. He went on a ride along with uh, police officers and he was asking what's the most common call. And the, uh, most common call that they had in this area was for mental health crisis of some sort. So they're having to call 911. So it's a significant, there's an event. And he started doing research and saw like the statistics. Um, And I'm not sure, I can't speak to exactly what they were measuring, but I know that he was alarmed by what he found. And so he got the schools very involved and they put like a mental health, um, counselor but over all of the schools not just your typical like counselor that sits in the school but she her um objective was to help like identify kids that were at risk and this is more for the kids not the parents mm. uh and but put in some really uh really cool programs to help identify the kids um and talk now again it's uh, there's still the narrative is a lot of around depression and anxiety um there's just (laughs) to my knowledge and there might be my you know my kids are older now out of high school so maybe they've evolved some um but there's just still not a lot of you know identifying the kids that have maybe something beyond that Uh, from again i'm i'm speculating from my own experience and i had a child who struggled and so I was right in the middle of all of this to find resources and alternatives. And, you know, we changed schools and that was um, a game changer for him. But the, you know, to get in, you know, I have ideas, <laughs> um, you know, to identify some, some of these kids and then, you know, dig, digging in a little deeper to find out if there's an issue, a level up, right? If there's an addiction issue with the parents or a mental health issue with the parents and then try to figure out how to come along and again, support the, the children. That's where my heart is. Um, so it's, you know, I don't, I have a, I don't have a good answer for it. I don't know of anything um, that I've come across, you know, even when I'm looking, she's like, surely we've got podcasts or something that are, again, are helping the children of the parents that are struggling and I can't find anything in this, the United States. And maybe I'm looking in the wrong place, but, uh, you know, I found you and I found, a, you know, uh, a one in the uh, UK and there's just, there's just not a lot from what I've done, what I've been able to find. Yeah, there's not. And the reason why, the reason why I think it's, it's ideas because I don't know what would help you. Well, actually I'll ask your opinion on this first is actually, what do you think would have helped you? So what would have been something that would have been tangible, let's say to support you, growing up would have would it have been maybe someone who was like a mentor or was it something where it be a financial support or what would have actually helped you growing up mm. 
I think like if the, you know, surely someone in the school, if someone could have tagged me in the school and brought me in and maybe brought in, my dad never would have done it. My mom couldn't have done it. So maybe a sibling or something and, and found out if I could have had, um, you know, maybe an after school program or something at a YMCA or something that would brought me in and, you know, 101, this is what your mom is going through. This is what your family member is going through. And then, and this is actually what I, I, I am working on something that I would love to do, provide some, tu- like after school services, you know, provide some tutoring, provide a, a laundry service. Like this sounds, <laughs> I don't know how this sounds, but I envision like a kid having a bag, you take it home and you put your laundry in it. Next day you bring it with you. And and maybe this is more suited for a YMCA, not a school setting, but we're going to teach you how to do laundry. We're going to, and we're, you know, and if you're really young, we're going to do the laundry for you, (laughs) or this is how to cook. This is how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Just if I had had those kind of like nutrition support, Laundry was a big deal. Tutoring would have been amazing because there's when you are as a child, you're under that much stress at home. You can't think <laughs> to concentrate on schoolwork. Like it's a struggle. And to, so I think to understand what it is and then just have those practical like active, activities of daily living, you know, laundry, food, um, and then the, the uh, tutoring that would have been a game changer, Mm -hmm. you know, and throw a mentor in there that just sort of naturally evolves as we're doing these things together. And I also, something else I would throw in there is help identify what the kiddos are good at, you know, how, what's your strength. Um, And you can do all kinds of creative things with that. Let them help them identify what their talent is or something they can feel positive about and grow and build confidence. For me, it was music. Um, and I could sing and I could run really fast because I, I, and so I walked on the track team and I, they put me right on varsity. You know, of course I only did it one year it was expensive. We couldn't buy shoes, all that stuff, but they put me, I was at the fastest person on the track team and I walked in in you know, the, the generic basketball shoes and outran everyone. And that was because I used to escape. I love horses. And I used to pretend like I was riding a horse and I would run for hours and hours and hours outside. And then just to escape what was inside the house. Mm. Um, So, yeah. So it's kind of, yammering on a bit but no you said some fantastic was, points then yeah. absolutely and the one i love you love i love what you said is about the um because a lot of people in our situation have lower self-esteem or lower self-confidence yeah. and it's important to find that thing you really like doing and then if someone yeah. can see that and they go right you know just do that all the time and just yeah. push yourself into that and then who knows what yeah. will come out of that right and i think that's right. a really good point about identifying what skill you have whether it be sport or creativity or whatever and then right. having, sp- you need someone there to help you though, like to sort of drive yes. you right. Because, um, yeah, you know, imagine how powerful to be someone Missy had, you know, they could have helped you with the track stuff. Oh, geez, you're a good runner. And yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe they could have paid for the shoes or something, or they yeah. could have, you know, sat you down and said, look, that could be a ticket to get a scholarship to college, college or whatever right. it is. And, you know, and just, you need that sort of, that older person to sort of help you out and take a bit of yep. interest. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that completely. Now, how, how did you, what were your, um, so you mentioned it then that your music and running was your sort of escape. So yeah. was it something that you realized like, look, I'm just going to to sort of zone out of stuff. I'm just going to throw myself into it and just do a heap of it. So was it something where you done, spent a lot of time in music growing up or was it running? Did you spend just a heap of time of it just to sort of, so you could avoid yeah. thinking about everything at home? Well, so all my mom was very musical and um, she was a country Western singer used to sing and they'd have, like these little jam sessions, you know, way back before I was born. And she would invite people over and she'd cook and they'd pull out the instruments and they'd all play. So my older siblings have these great memories of mom doing that. And she would always sing in church. And she, the older ones, she would, she sang on a radio station in Chicago and then some, uh, it's called the uh, the Indiana Roof uh, Ballroom. It's still going here in Indiana, 
And she would take the kids and they would sing and she taught the kids how to harmonize. Well, that just trickled down and everybody sang at church. So all 10 of us sing and we play instruments and there's professional um, musicians in the family. And, um, and that was our escape. And that's when everybody was happy. Like when we were all singing together, my dad was happy. Um, and he took a lot of pride in the fact that we could all sing really well and we could harmonize with anything. And um, so, and we, we're a spiritual bunch. Like when you look, and I'm telling you like one side of the story, like there's a whole another side of the story that I, I don't know how to talk about yet with my dad. So I'm, I don't want to dig into that, but it was especially challenging with both sides, just pure dysfunction. And so we really um, just immersed ourselves in music. It was an escape. That's where, you know, my sister got the lead in the play at school because she could sing or the musical at school. You know, my brother, uh, he would sit down and play his violin or the piano and mom would smile and dad would be happy. And, you know, it just brought this, I don't know, it wasn't a level of distraction. It was more therapy, really. It was therapeutic. And so I just fell right in line with it, you know, and I could sing and I was no one in high school until uh, somebody convinced me to try out for the musical. And here I am, literally the kid that has no friends, the stairs at the floor when she walks, scared to death. And, but I knew I could sing. And I, I got the lead in that musical. And it was a game changer for me. And then when I went to college and I, I put myself through college, we all did, um, by recruiting for the school, by singing and acting. And uh, just, we had this, if I feel like God said, okay, I'm going to give this to you because <laughs> this is going to help you build confidence and, and be able to, uh, you know, you can get up on a stage and perform and be what you wanted to be. You know, it was, uh, it was um, just really a game changer for me. And then I had this confidence that just built through that and, um, you know, and then did, some professional acting just a little you know a little bit after that but it was it was like oh I can do this I'm good at this you know um so but music that that was a big thing that I think uh got us through and again I you know when I look back um does it make sense that we're here you know I was one pen stroke from not being here the you know, doctor said there's no way my mom should have had me and my dad couldn't do it you know, he, he saved my life that day because he couldn't sign the paper. Um, so, and that was true for my older brother, number nine in the family as well. Like they were like, she should not have this child mm. and he, he couldn't do it. And, uh, you know, both my brother and I are, are we're number nine and number 10 in the family. Mm. And I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, which is you said about victim, victimhood mentality. And I think that's, um, something that's good for you probably explain because I talk about it a lot. And um, because mm -hmm. I used to, I used to use it as an excuse for a very long time, you know, look, and I just sort of, you sort of think the universe is going to hand you all this stuff because you had a, a bad existence. So it sort of owes you the world owes you, but it doesn't, you work out <laughs> as you get older, it doesn't, it's not going right. to, not going to, you got to do it yourself. So right. do you want to talk about the victim mindset or something from your perspective and, um, and how maybe did you ever, were you ever in that sort of situation where, and then you had to pull oh, yourself sure. out of it or, yeah, do you want to talk about sure. that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because, you know, growing up when I had such low self-esteem and dealing with all of this intense, like just a crippling anxiety, uh, you know, and being bullied and not having anyone to turn to for help and just having to step through that was in such intense anxiety. And I, you know, sort of, you know, I got through college uh, and again, it was just, you didn't have a roadmap. I never had anyone mm. like, what fork do you use? You know, when you, when I was in college, we never went out to eat we didn't even do fast food, right? We were always gardening and, um, and cooking at home. And I didn't know what I was doing. And it was almost as I was writing my book, it's like, I, didn't talk about our circumstances for many, many years. And then in high school, I would share just a little bit, 
But when you share these kinds of details, like with the average person, I've learned quickly, it's too much. Like people, uh, and when you're in high school and that age and lack maturity, like, like they're, you know, like, what, you know, that it was too much. Well, for me, you know, this was, this is what I knew was my life, but it, it evolved into, I think, because I had such poor self-esteem, it's almost like I wanted to apologize for the way I was by saying, well, my mom has schizophrenia and mental illness and she wasn't there for me. So this is why I don't know all this stuff. And this is why I'm, you know, not as good as everyone else. And I had like this thing going and I realized I actually went to this conference. My oldest brother, number one and number nine had gone to this conference called Focus and it was in Kansas City, Missouri. And um, it was like this, this, I don't know, self-discovery over a weekend where they helped you kind of dive back into issues from childhood and kind of unpack some things and resolve some things. And it was during that, I was terrified to go, but I went. And it was one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Um, and I remember like we had, un we had unpacked a series of like things that I had gone through and I had like, there was a facilitator and I had shared a story where my dad had said, um, she's not much to look at talking about me until she smiles. And I was, I was, <laughs> oh, I was so painful at the time, you know, yeah. I have your dad and my dad used to say, oh, she's not, very, this one's not very smart. She couldn't spell a cat to save her life. Cause I was a, horrific speller I've had to work very hard to correct that through the years now I'm a great speller <laughs> but you know when your dad is saying stuff like that about you are like oh yeah yeah I'm dumb I'm you know I because of this I'm I'm not very smart and it was this turning point where um I had shared this story and they just kind of looked at me like are you gonna keep the same narrative are you going to keep with the same story that yeah you're the youngest of 10 and this was what your help i if that's what you're going to settle for you're going to you're okay with that and i don't know what it was and the way this facilitator said whatever he said but it was like a light switch went off for me and all of a sudden i it was like this determination welled up in me and i was i have a choice I can choose. I can go figure things out. If I don't know, I can go ask somebody I think knows and I can informationally interview them and I can figure this out. Like I, there is, um, I don't know. I don't know if it was a God thing. I don't know, but it was just something that welled up inside of me. And I'm like, and it was so energizing. Like I can determine my future, hmm. you know, all of a sudden, that old narrative like dropped away and you, you deal with that. You unpack that as you mature and get older, but that was a big just change for me, you know, to figure out that I'm, I'm not a victim of what I've, what I was born into. Um, you know, and you, you also have to fight the, Oh my gosh, am I going to end up with this? right? Am I going to inherit this? Because for mm -hmm. you know, like that's a, that's a strong, you know, genetic simple and none, the 10 of us, none of us have it. We have a fair amount of, you know, anxiety and depression that folks have dealt with, but no one has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, which is a miracle in itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, but that, and, and, you know, I, I still bump up on things through life and things that I have to unpack and look at and say, okay, this is, become a recurring theme and it's not healthy and I've got to unpack this. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty determined that, if, you know, if I have to go get help, if I have to go on medication, if I have to, you know, exercise more, I, I I'm big on mental health healing uh, or coping with an illness, like is an integrated approach. Cause I saw them throw medicine after medicine, after medicine at my mom, and that did not work. But you know, when I could get her out and to walk or she would lift, it, she would become brighter. And, you know, through my own experience through some significant um, postpartum depression that I went through and, and I had panic attacks through when my second son was born, but I, I was so determined that 
my children would never have what I had. I was going to fight my way out of this. And by God, I did and started yoga and, you know, meditation and watching what I eat, what you drink or what you don't drink, um, supplements and not isolating. That's a big one. You know, staying in relationship with other healthy people um, is self-development, those kinds of things. That's an in, I'm a firm believer, integrated approach that would have significantly helped my mother. No, you're spot on, Missy, and um, you, you're 100% right. And in Australia here, my mum, before she passed away, she had, um, we're very lucky. We have a, we have like a, a good healthcare system in regards to anyone can get what they need. And because my mum was classed as a lot higher, higher risk, she got a lot more money from the government to help with services. And that was all about integrated living. So it'd be someone from the, um, who would have lived experience, who would have mental health condition as well, would take her out for coffee, you know, twice a week, or uh-huh. she'd, take, she'd take you to the gym and she'd go do yoga even though she couldn't do it, like she'd just be there. Right. But like, but this is the right. stuff that they would do. That's and they, awesome. they sort of understood the integrated living thing for her, which was important. Or they have someone come to her yeah. house every morning and give her a tablet or a nutritionist and all that sort of stuff. And she'd ring me every day and tell me I've gone to the nutritionist. I've done that because uh, she had a big problem with eating junk food and not exercising yeah. enough. And she'd tell right, me oh, I've exercised right. and if she wouldn't. So you're spot on about the integrated living thing. People just want to go, Oh, you know, Go to go get diagnosed with depression, and here's a whole bunch of antidepressants, and away you go. Rather than saying, "Well, yeah. are you exercising? You know, what's your relationships like? Do you have anything that you like doing that gives you confidence? These sorts of things." And I think you're right. That's that's that all helps, doesn't it? As you would know, that would yeah. have helped your mum, and that that helps. That's majorly important. Yeah, absolutely. And I want I want to talk about your um, how did you? So obviously. People, you can't just, it's very hard to just go, oh, that was the past and then just move on, right? So yeah. you've got, you're going to have things that subconsciously or you're wiring from from young, like you might not realize you have, I never considered myself having PTSD or anything, right? But when I look at it objectively, you go, well, there's a lot of trauma in that yeah. environment that I never really dealt with. Being a bloke, you don't talk to anyone. But yeah. <laughs> um, but where how did you, yeah, was it something where you got, did you go actively see a psychologist or a therapist to sort of try and get to, to, to sort of tell your story, open up to them, and then you sort of have some objectively go, yeah, geez, that was pretty full on, and you know, and tell you things to sort of get um, get better about your life. Or how did you how have you gone through that? Yeah, it was. Um, gosh, I I can't remember the exact catalyst of why I went. I think I was I was dealing with some anger issues with with my dad actually, and my again my brother. There's 26 years between number one and me. And my brother, my oldest brother is my hero. He's very wise. And I think he had seen that I was going through some things and, and I was trying to understand the older I got, the more I'm like starting to talk to my older siblings, like help me understand this. there's chunks. I don't remember at all from my childhood. And I would go to my older siblings. What do you remember about this period? Or what do you remember? And, and he had suggested um, you should go see a counselor. And I was very resistant to it because there was still such a stigma, you know, attached to it. Finally, you know, he said, if you were my daughter, and I was sort of like his daughter, um, he said, I would send you to this guy. And so I, he, my brother called the range, I went and I met with the guy and, you know, started to unpack things. And um, I felt better. It was like a, a step in the right direction. Uh, you know, sometimes like when you do something that you've never done, it's like it has that backlash effect. So at, at first I felt worse, like, oh, I shouldn't be talking about this. You're not supposed to talk about these things. And then uh, I think it was the determination um, that I had way before I had kids that when I did have children, they would they were going to have a much better life they were going to have a great life i was going to be the mom extraordinaire you know uh, for these kids and even before they were born even before i was married i was like informationally interviewing like my roommate in college she was amazing and i was talking to her parents what'd you do if to raise such a good person you know and i remember them looking at me like what <laughs> and um so that started my journey. I think a lot of it really that fueled my my keeping going back into counseling uh, was this um, self awareness that was developing over time. Of I've got some anger issues, 
and I've got uh, anxiety issues for sure, although I didn't know exactly what to call it back then. And I knew that I was going to need help. And I, when I was in college and seeing my roommate's parents and seeing what, how they lived, all of a sudden lights are coming on like, oh, wow. <laughs> We were really, really, uh, this was not healthy. And as I'm having these realizations about my own upbringing, I'm seeing I'm going to need help. I'm going to need help. I had enough self-awareness. I don't know how, but I did that. I'm going to need help. And so I started into counseling and then um, I got married and that didn't go well <laughs> the first time around. Uh, and through that, a lot of issues, a lot of counseling uh you know, through that whole experience um, that helped me unpack more things. But, you know, to be honest with you, I am I am just now, I think, into the journey of, um, like, there's another suitcase that has to be unpacked for me now that I'm in my 50s. And I'm seeing, um, you know, there's just some things that keep creeping up in my life and I'm tired. Like, I think I can, I've gotten over on it and it's still there. And I'm like, okay, we're going into another phase now of I'm realizing um, just the effects of these, it was significant trauma. Um, so I've just happened on, I think his name is Russell Kennedy and he's written a book called Anxiety Rx. And it's a something I've never heard before. So I'm just starting to read his book and um you know, unpacking again, an, another suitcase, you know, it's not as heavy as they used to be, but it's something else I've got to open up and okay, let's, let's deal with this and, and make some more progress. Yeah, no, that's and, great. That's uh, great to hear. But I think, yeah, there's a lot of trauma and it's sort of interesting because I never associated well, it's just, you, that's what you grew up with. You know what I mean? Like you don't sort yeah. of go on all, oh, it's all traumatic and stuff and that, like you, it was not ideal, but it's sort of, you got to have that foresight to realize when you look at if you did speak to a psychologist or a counselor objective, they probably would tell you you've got a lot of yeah. people in our situations would have had a lot of trauma, right? And we've just been really right. good to um sort of push it away and deal with. But as you said, it can bubble up with different things, whether it be uh, anger issues or you know, people right. with alcoholism or whatever it is, bad relationships, whatever yeah. it is. So right, right. And you've got to deal with it. But um, I was going to say, what what do you think you've gained from your from your childhood that you wouldn't? Let's say, for example, you had with without without having um the mental illness involved in your family, what, what do you think would have changed or what do you think you've got as a skill now that you've got from your childhood that others wouldn't? Yeah, no, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm, uh, I would say I'm an empath. Like I, I have empathy. Um, my son's the same. One son is very, very empathetic, but I can empathize with people and, um, and I actually listen uh, and I sort of picked up as I've gotten old, like I'm very sincere when I ask someone, how are you doing? Like, I really want to know. It's not just a turn of phrase of, you know, oh, I'm great. How are you? You know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's one thing I'm very um, interested uh, in people and being authentic. Like that's one of my core values because I lived the other way for so long having to act one way when you know all this turmoil is going on um so being authentic is very uh, important to me and i think i draw that out of people um i can read a room i can read people and like subtle little changes in behavior um, and that came from trying to navigate my dad trying to navigate my mom um, that would be my superpower <laughs> you know but it makes me great in my job um, cause I can, I can just kind of tell like when somebody has got a certain, what's important to them and what's not, what's annoying, what's not, um, you know, it, it has been good. My, my boys, I have great relationship with them. Um, you know, they tell me <laughs> sometimes too much, but it's, um, I have a really incredible bond with them where, like from a very young age, because we never talked about how we felt about anything. I was very purposeful with them. And when they're very young, something would happen. They'd hit their head, their hand or something. I'm like, you know, are you, did that hurt? You know, helping them come out with, or are you mad? Are you angry? Are you, do you feel shame? Do helping them give words to emotions. Um, and they're fabulous communicators now. Uh, 
and we're all very tight. And I think that came from being very purposeful of we're going to talk about things. We're going to unpack things appropriately. So, you know, and I, I'm really proud that my, my three guys are um, just, and, and they've got these great hearts, you know, they're just really, they're all very giving and caring. Uh, and I would say that's very true of my family as well. I think they're very empathetic. My siblings were very empathetic, very generous people. Um, having gone through some really tough, tough times. Um, those are just a couple of things that come to mind. It's a great question. I'll have to think about that more. Well, <laughs> I reckon, well, you must be very resilient because you to obviously have, you know, you've got this going at home and then you go to school and unfortunately, you know, someone's bullying you as well. Like it's just, right. You, so you must be extremely resilient because a lot of people yeah. could go one way or the other. They could crumble and yes. go, right, I'm going to be an alcoholic right. or drug addiction or whatever. Right. Where you, right. You've, you've managed to stay on the straight and narrow and, you know, and yes. you go on, go on and have a, a, a beautiful family and then have a, yes. have a great career and stuff. So you must be extremely yeah. resilient. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's probably, there's not much. <laughs> Hmm. that you could throw at me in everyday life that I would not be able to handle um, and knock on wood. <laughs> Please Jesus. <laughs> Cause that's yeah, the one thing. Exactly, cause, yeah. Yeah. Cause that's the one thing yeah. I want to want people in our situation to know is because like, you know, from being in business, but like the one, the number one skill most people say, if you need to be an entrepreneur or successful is resilience. It's the yeah. number one indicator of success. It's not about how yeah. smart you are or how good looking you are right. or whatever. It's about right. can you just stay in there and hang in there as long as you can. And right. the advantage of us of our situations is that we had a really tough situation, which is going to be far more tougher than most anything we're going to right. experience as an adult. So that's the sort of the point I want to get across to people, right. younger yeah. people, especially like if you're going through a bad situation currently, yeah. it's almost training in a way for the real right. world. And the real world yeah. is not going to be able to really, right. like if you just go back to your you know, use your, I'm not saying use your traumas, but use your past experiences as your sort of like your cookie jar where you can go in and sort of have a cookie and write that. Nah, I've been through that. That's far harder than what I'm going to do today. Um, right. You can use it as that fuel um, to, to your success. I think we've got a, a good advantage in a way, I would say. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I guess I did, I, I'm the most determined person that I know. <laughs> like for me, the resiliency, determination, I was asking again, my husband, I'm like, what do you think? And he's like, oh my God, you're the most determined person. No, never means no. It's why I'm so great, you know, again, in sales. No, never means no. There's always a side, there's always a way around. And, and again, that does point right back because there were such incredibly difficult situations, like having to get on that damn bus when I knew I was going to have gum thrown in my hair. I was going to, people weren't going to let me sit down. It was torture and I had to walk through it. I didn't have a choice. My dad would have, you know, lost it on me. I had to get on that bus and it was awful. You know, and I had like, there are many experiences like that. So when I, you go through stuff like that, then, you know, I know in sales or, or whatever, having to, it, something as small as having to wait in a line and you know, people are freaking out all around yeah. <laughs> just like yeah just calm calm down exactly you know, right. yeah. this is absolutely nothing yeah <laughs> I, I, I get in trouble with my um my girlfriend a bit because i always say oh it's not a problem i say it's not a problem all the time oh and, yeah you know they're not trying to problem. make some, make something into a problem I'm like no it's not a problem <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's absolutely nothing yeah it's frustrating all the time but i was going to say yeah, yeah I, 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 feel, I feel sorry i'm not I'm really sorry to hear about the bullying stuff because I think that's something a common theme I've had yeah. from other people on here where they've said they were bullied at school. And it, it's very annoying for me because um I didn't have that experience at school. Maybe I had a little bit with one person, but that's it. I didn't have that. So it's hard for me to really, I can only imagine how hard it would have been to have this home situation plus the school situation. So yeah, what's some advice or what do you think for someone who was in that situation or what can be done to help it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, if if there's a bullying situation and your parents are not available, you know, if you have one parent, absolutely go and, and share and tell. And if you don't have that, then yeah, but go tell the school counselor, tell someone. Don't don't just try to gut it out and, and isolate. Um, you know, if it's if it's you know, someone like us, you know, who we don't have that parental support and like low self-esteem, you're going to want to just suck it up and endure. 
And you don't have to do that. Mm. You, you, there are resources that tell, you know, the tolerance for bullying now is at an all time low. I mean, you say the word bullying and here in the States where they're jumping to deal with it, it's a lot more, um, uh, a hot subject where, it, where it's just not tolerated. Um, so, you know, and I had, I had one of my boys, you know, was bullied boy, you know, and I, <laughs> I need jerk reacted and was in that, in that school, but we had it dealt with. Uh, so if you can't tell your parents and tell, you know, tell somebody to get support, because I can't imagine that it would be, if you bring it, you know, put light on it. It's like often, you know, so, <laughs> so much of the dysfunction and so much of everything for years and years, it's like, you don't talk about it. You don't feel it. You don't share it. Right. And, and once you can, get it exposed get some light on it then it can be dealt with so i think that would be my number one bit of advice and what about um some advice for a young person in who's who has a parent with a mental illness what's some things you could tell them um Mm. that you think would have helped you if you heard it yeah when they were younger yeah i would say you know the biggest bit of hope is like i'm an example of someone who walked a really tough road it was really tough and and again i had it from i was dodging both sides my my dad and my mom and if i can make it boy you can make it as well um and i and i'm living a great life and you just (laughs) there are resources and there is help and you're you're not a victim of all of this you can choose your own stars you can you can figure it out if you don't know if you've not been taught there's this beautiful thing called the informational interview (laughs) where you go to someone who you think does know and you say can i have 20 minutes of your time i'm trying to learn this and no one everybody no one's ever said no to me and and then you can ask questions and you can learn about what you don't know if it's how to get into college if it is how to try out for the high school you know football team track team whatever um just ask for help if it is, um, you know, if, if you're like maybe college age, um, you know, don't be afraid to go get counseling and have somebody, one, one safe person that you can just unpack things with. Because I think so, so many will get stuck up here and just ruminate in your own thoughts. And you can't trust your own thoughts sometimes. Sometimes you need another person to come in especially when you just don't have a good example or you have no example, um, then that is amazing to have someone step in and say, no, I would feel the same way. Or no, I, I don't think that you, this, this uh, train of thought is helpful for you. It just kind of speak some truth and some hope and some light into your life. Um, you know, seek out, listen to these podcasts where you can see that there are others like us um, and listen to these great success stories and advice and the hope there's all kinds of hope so I think yeah you know just get determined and um, just know like if man if you and I can do it they can do it too you're, you're going to make it absolutely it's gonna be okay yeah 100 that's a great point and um, before we end it today I just want to just ask you quickly about your book your writing. Yeah. So maybe you want to talk about your book, your writing, when are you planning on releasing it? And um, what you, what's it going to be about? Yeah. So I, the working title right now is the wounds that made me whole. And it's just, you know, how to survive and thrive um, being raised by, you know, parents with mental illness. And I'm still f- sort of forming it, um, how I'm doing this. So it's probably a year out still. Uh, there's a lot of writing still to do and a lot of editing and I'll self-publish. Um, so, but I, it, again, it's sharing much of what we've talked about. Uh, I'll share quite a few stories in there and some sort of my lessons learned and sharing my journey. And it, again, it is just to provide and to give hope to those who are in the situation um, who maybe are too afraid to talk to others, but would read a book or listen to a book on, on, um, you know, audible or whatnot. So, and, um, yeah, so that's the primary reason for, for writing the book. I hope to include, I've written 
I'm a musician. I started um, writing songs of uh, hope and healing that I'll probably integrate into the the audible portion of the book. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to do that. Just to be, I'm a creative. I like doing things just a bit different. So I'll incorporate that in, into the book as well, into the audio version. Yeah, I think we're going to share one of your songs. So hopefully, um, when you send yeah, it through, just... we'll, we'll, we'll put it on this, or we'll put it on a separate thing. I reckon. So we'll share it. Yeah, Roger. But yeah, yeah, I'll get it a proper recording of it and get it to you. Yeah. Yeah, and it might make you happy to hear this. But in Australia, we have um, there's a there's an organisation called Satellite Foundation who specifically look after kids who young kids who have a parent with a mental illness and they bring them together and they, because a lot of kids can't verbalize what they're going through that it's all for expression. So they do music classes, they do art, they do photography, ah. they do all these things. So songwriting ah. and stuff is all part of that. And that's what this organization does. And the government's finally funding them. So they've, after like 11 ah. years of being volunteered, they've got like $12 million from the government here, which is great. So, cause they're now starting to see the importance of supporting these kids. So yeah, we, we there is very slowly happening over here in regards to these organizations specifically are there to help kids. And that's the channel they're doing it through is with um, music. And, that's and those amazing. Sorts of things. Yeah. Because that's the point amazing. of it is because every kid they bring into the room has a parent with a mental illness. So imagine yeah. how powerful that would have been for you as a young person. Uh, being, <laughs> yeah, imagine you're on a bus and you go from, you go to the main city and then you've got, you know, 50 kids and they're all got the same thing. And you know, that's, yeah, that's what the point of it is. And I think that's the most helpful thing. I really think it would be for would have been for us is just having if you had another yeah. family or something that you knew have had a similar situation or kids wow, yeah i think it's really absolutely. important absolutely yeah but that's what, amazing yeah. but what i'd love to do miss is um love to have you on when your book's done um sure. look, looking forward to sharing your your song as well and um thank you, thank you for making the time because it's hard obviously being in different time zones so yeah uh thank you very much for making the time and and putting the hat on as well it's getting the given yeah. the, <laughs> given the country vibe yeah um, <laughs> You're an amazing person and thank you for reaching out and sharing your story. And I'm really happy to hear you're successful and you've got a great family and yeah. you're happy in life and all your siblings get along, which I think is even more, that's yeah. magic. Having 10 siblings, yeah. which are like that, that's not very yeah. common. So it's fantastic. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank you. I so appreciate this opportunity and, and I'm just so glad I found you. So I likewise. I'm listening, I'm listening to all your, all your work. So thank no, you. Thanks, Missy. Appreciate it. Thank you.